welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. And as always, at the end of the month, the last Wednesday, we have Emily Jashinsky back on High Noon uh, to, to do one of these docket episodes, round up some, some stories for the month that we thought uh, shouldn't go without further discussion. And also to have a good time, as we always do at these After Dark episodes. For those who are unaware, Emily Jashinsky is the culture editor over at The Federalist. She is a senior um, senior fellow with us at IWF, and she also trains up conservative journalists over at Young America's Foundation. And to complete the long list of titles, which I could add further to, um, <laughs> she also has a uh, segment with um, over on Breaking Points with Crystal and Sager, and it's called Counterpoints. I believe now it's on Wednesdays. It airs on Wednesdays. That's right. It's hard to keep up. Also, Inez, far be it for me to critique your introduction, but I did like the way that you said, uh, welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people and Emily. (laughs) (laughs) Emily is one of our most interesting people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I I thought we'd we'd start on an appropriately political note here with the State of the Union, um, which kind of seemed to blow by this time and Frankly, that I think that's usually a good frame to think about the State of the Union. It very, very rarely actually matters beyond a week of chattering class back and forth. Um, but I did want to bring up one sort of 10,000 or 30,000 foot level point that I'm curious whether or not you agree with. And that's that it really struck me um, that Biden is kind of the last guy standing who's able to make this particular sort of democratic pitch, because this was a traditional labor Democrat pitch. It highlighted um, government spending. It highlighted um, programs that gave you know, money and checks to people. Um, it talked about investment, even in, in infrastructure. It sounded a little America firsty in places. And it really, really downplayed all the things that we've been talking about, about like the, the professional managerial class interest that now functionally runs the Democratic Party, whether that's on culture or economics. Notable to me, he did he barely mentioned there was one word, which is annoying because I'm waiting to put out a piece on it and I thought I could use it as my hook. Um, <laughs> but he barely said a word about the loan forgiveness program, right, which mm-hmm. is a direct handout to the, the the new most powerful constituency in the Democratic Party, that that professional managerial class. But what do you think about this speech? The the I would say the popular, relatively popular agenda. That is not to say that it's a good one, but a, the relative relatively popular agenda it represented. And do you think any other Democrat coming up in the ranks behind Biden can actually still make this labor Democratic pitch? We had exactly the same reaction to the State of the Union, apparently, because that was my thought was, how terrifying is it that uh, Joe Biden is really the only Democrat I could envision um, talking about one thing in particular? And he emphasized it. He didn't just mention it once. It was a theme of his speech. And he spent a good chunk of time talking about bringing back pride in the country, build back pride. He said several times that we need to restore pride in the United States of America. And you really cannot envision another Democrat uh, talking like that at all for myriad reasons. But um, it's interesting, especially as we're sort of getting to the end of uh, Jimmy Carter's life. It was announced uh, late this month that he was heading into hospice. And there's a lot of comparisons or parallels that have made been made with the malaise he oversaw in the 1970s to the high levels of inflation, inflation the high levels of foreign conflict that we have right now under Joe Biden. Um, But Joe Biden is really trying to project a sense of confidence and strength and optimism and patriotism. Um, And I just don't know who else is out there. So that could, that is willing to make that argument at all, whether or not they actually would is a different question, but that they, whether or not they would actually believe it is a different question than whether they would even make the argument. So uh, from a big picture perspective, The economic populism of Joe Biden's speech, like you just, as you said, and as we have to basically grade State of the Unions on curves, right? Like the liar curve, like these are politicians. They're going to say all kinds of falsehoods. Different sides are going to be hypocrites for standing up or not standing up. Like we know that's all going to happen. But 
for him to emph- emphasize economic populism, populism and patriotism, he did not touch uh, much on the border or on China, which I think speaks to a huge um, flaw both in the Democratic Party and the broader left, certainly in his administration uh, from the populist perspective. But um, to emphasize those two subjects when they are as out of fashion as possible, um, not just in the Democratic Party of today, but in the Democratic Party of tomorrow, which we know because we know who's coming up through the ranks of the Democratic Party. Um, it's it's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's bittersweet because I'm glad that you have a Democrat that's trying to muster American patriotism and trying to restore it now, um, but sad that I don't think that will last much longer. So, I mean, enjoy the moment while you can. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, look, it's obviously in sharp contrast with what his administration is actually doing, right? Um, and, and by that, I don't just mean that, of course, like every president, you know, in every state of the union, he's taking credit for things he probably shouldn't. He's lying about the success of his programs, right? Like, these these are old hat. We, we expect these things in politics, right? But, um, you know, he really downplayed a lot of the things that his administration is doing, right? His administration, right after the speech, put out a new DEI order that applies it to the entire federal government and entrenches a lot of this cultural wokeism that is sort of the unpopular side of the democratic agenda. Um, and, and that's hardly the first sort of cultural, um, like, uh, nail he's driven in to, to the coffin, right? So um, his, his administration, largely the output the actual policy output um, has been for this this sort of woke managerialism, um, mm. or or if you're you're a part of the, the old school left, you know woke technocracy or, or neoliberalism, right? Um, the the blending of the extreme social views and extreme cult- cultural views with a more moderate and moving away from sort of labor economic politics. Um, this was the opposite, right? He he barely said a word. I mean, he said. One word here, one word there, but I mean, he really did not emphasize. He did not emphasize cultural issues. He did not emphasize the trans stuff. He had like a line here or there to satisfy. Like uh, this was really like a meat and potatoes labor speech, right? Um, mm-hmm. And but that's not what his administration is doing. That's not the output of his administration. Is focused very, very sharply on cultural issues. Um, but it's interesting to me that he he. He may be the last Democrat that under at least understands that this is the popular part of their agenda and that the other part of their agenda is very unpopular, um, except with this limited class group. And increasingly, that's that's all that that seems to matter. Um, It's hard to imagine AOC giving a speech like this, for example. Yeah. And I've been thinking about that for years because there's this terrifying question lingering over the Democratic Party party when it comes to people like Ilhan Omar, AOC, but even like a Kamala Harris. What do you think is so good about this country? Uh, And what do you think your voters think is good and worth preserving about this country? And obviously, conservatives have been, um, you know, concerned by that question for decades, you know, when you have legions of like Chomsky followers uh, that are flocking to the Democratic Party, it, you know, makes you nervous, right? Like that this anti-American sentiment is becoming mainstream. But now I think you really have to ask the question, like I, I pay attention to what Ilhan Omar says about this stuff. And I can't think of what she possibly likes about this country. Seriously. Like I, I really, really don't know because um, some of the things you would expect her maybe not to like, she still thinks we haven't gone too far on probably the issue, like uh, the full spectrum of LGBT issues. She probably thinks we haven't gone far enough on, uh, you know, the, the CRT type policies, defunding the police, um, abolishing ICE, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so w- what are you trying to preserve uniquely about the United States of America? What do you like it? Why is it worth preserving? Joe Biden has a very clear answer to that question. Hillary Clinton can give a very clear answer to that question. Barack Obama can give a very yeah, clear answer they're all, to that let's, question. Let's, let's not be naive. I mean, most of them are lying, um, but, but they felt the need to lie. Yep. Um, that That's kind of the point, right? They were going for a different constituency um, and they felt the need to lie about it. Now, I don't know. I don't know. Actually, Biden might be out of the, those people, the, the least lying about, about it. But um, in, in any case, like it, it hasn't gone along with substance for a long time for the left, but all of these successive democratic politicians recognized that 
their avant-garde cultural politics were only the 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 tail right to the meat the meat of their party which was labor politics and now Mm -hmm. The tail is wagging the dog, and Biden is just sort of the, the the last mouthpiece of this old Democratic Party, even that is even willing to lie on its behalf, right? And I, I wonder what I wonder what happens uh, when that that cover goes away, because well, I, to some extent the realignment has been uh, more of a blip than a lot of people predicted, and I wonder what happens when the cover gets blown off. Yep. Um, yep. That's a a good point. And it's exactly what I was just thinking, basically, that like one of the reasons I find this terrifying is if we can't all agree that we're part of a fundamentally good country, then the American project is not something we can do together. So if Ilhan Omar is, is not, you know, proud of the country she represents as a member of the House of Representatives, if she doesn't think it is a fundamentally good entity, that it is a force for good. And we have reason to question whether or not she thinks that because she compared it to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban uh, in a tweet. I mean, if you're doing that, if you're drawing moral equivalencies, which is exactly what she did, she was talking about, I think, Hamas um, put them all in the same like level of committing atrocities. Um, so if you can't fundamentally say that you believe that we are all engaged in a project for the good of humanity, for the good of the American people, first and foremost, then what's the point? Like, what are we working on? Why, why will you bother to come to the table on issue X, Y, or Z, if you don't give a damn about America and you care more about, as people correctly point out, if you see yourself more as a global citizen, a citizen of the world than a citizen of the United States, um, and that's really what this issue fundamentally gets at. I mean, you can't govern together when um, a, a huge chunk of the governing population sees itself as more loyal to like this cause of uh, the the world and the globe um, than it does to the country that it represents. Which an interest, by the way, which also sits orthogonally to the traditional labor politics of the Democratic Party in a very direct and obvious way. Mm. Um, I'm glad you're you're bringing this up because there there's been there's been a bunch of sort of think pieces and uh, tweets from folks on the left and the right to a certain extent about peak wokeness Um, Mm. and whether this, this cultural movement, uh, a large chunk of which is this idea that you're pointing to that the United States is fundamentally um, an evil racist country, that there is no (laughs) common project uh, that is of any value um, that, that unites Americans. Right. Um, so there's all this talk about it being like basically peak wokeness. And some of the evidence I've seen cited for that is is simply like high profile de- defectors, right? Um, usually Gen X defectors. And um, also I've seen some of the attempt to put meat on like statistical meat on this by saying um, the number of publications of sort of uh, CRT buzzwords or like the alphabet mafia buzzwords, right, uh, are, are, are declining in academic pub- publication, right? So like they kind of peaked in 2020. And since then, they're really going going down. And and people are arguing that, okay, well, we're going to, and, and I, I would put in this category and more substantively, like, th- there have been some some actual victories for the cultural right in, um, especially in regard to uh, a lot of IW, IWF and IWV's good work in regard to women's sports, for example. Um, mm-hmm. There does to be a certain amount of tide turning going on on, on minor gender mm-hmm. transition, where even the New York Times is getting blasted from their left flank um, for publishing, you know, just basic scientific information about how horrendous this kind of uh, medical experimentation on children is. Of course, they wouldn't they wouldn't phrase it that way. They weren't inflammatory about it at all. The opposite, they went over backwards. Uh, but it made it into the pages of the New York Times. There was a Washington Post story as well about it. So some of it, people are adding all this up and saying, well, maybe the tide is turning to a certain extent. Uh, maybe the the most fanatical portion of this woke ideology is kind of behind us. I I see something different, which is the final consolidation of institutional power uh, to the point where it's no longer avant-garde and no longer required to be, you know, sort of in the faculty lounges as, as main driving force. Now 
it's it's an executive order from the president. Um, so I, I'm curious where you fall on that. Do you think that there is a certain kind of thawing um, or or victories against this culture meaningful, or is this merely the consolidation and the sort of uh, standardization, best practices, the kind of um, corporatizing of this of, of this ideology uh, that is is making it drop a little bit off the the front lines? Uh, there was a compact magazine piece about this, mm -hmm, wasn't yeah. there recently? Yeah, I, that piece made me really angry. Um, and it's not because that it, it obviously I think most of what was in the article was true. Like it was pointing to, as you said, and as high profile case studies of de defectors and victories for those defectors um, in various institutions. And that that is all accurate, 100 percent. But um, the big picture question is so different than the vibe shift. And it's it's just what you're pointing out, that like we can have this this vibe shift in the energy where people start like start realizing, hey, like we're going to pull back on some of this stuff, whatever. Um, but we don't know the full scope of the damage yet. And we won't for years. Um, we, we do know, though, that multiple generations of Americans have already been educated in and conditioned in an environment where they don't see themselves in the sort of Republican, small r Republican sense as Republican citizens of a fundamentally good country. We know that they are um, litigating their private, personal, professional, academic lives on uh, devices that are designed to function like slot machines. And we know that they are drowning in mental health problems. Um, we know that they are incredibly obese and unhealthy. And we know that that cuts lives short and makes lives miserable in incredible ways. Uh, we know that they're unhappy and frustrated sexually, even if they're not taking those risks. We know that they aren't not taking those risks in a totally healthy way. Um, you know, things like teen pregnancies being down is a good thing, but um, if it's because children are too afraid uh, to engage in any risk-taking behaviors, that's not a good thing. So uh, this is like, you have an entire generation, two generations that has yet to enter the workforce in uh, large numbers. Um, and you just, the conditioning is so incredibly deep because they blew up the foundation um, in everyone's minds, right? Like uh, there was no foundation of like fundamental objective reality about this country, um, about mm -hmm. God, about the world around you. And so what was built on those uh, soils is rickety um, at best. And so uh, they've been conditioned to have a lot of really bad ideas about their sex and gender, about race, about um, family and sex and all of those different things. Uh, and so when we are more under their control than we are right now, um, we're not going to say that the the cultural revolution ended in 2022 or that, you know, the wokeness died in, in 2022 and it's fallen out of fashion with a good chunk um, of people who are in leadership positions in business, government and, and media. But even then it hasn't fallen out of fashion with all of them. Um, and they have already changed the perspectives and implanted this ideology in the minds of a couple of generations um, in, in huge numbers and on a scale we won't be able to comprehend until they enter the workforce, just as we started to see this happen when millennials entered the workforce. So it's just way like premature um, and I think short-sighted to uh, you know look at the vibe shift, which is real, and say it means that wokeness is over. Yeah, it's also just not translating into anything but an acceleration on the ground itself mm. so one really good um metric that i you know it's hard to hard to measure uh, but just from talking to parents for example it is becoming harder not easier to find a pediatrician that mm -hmm. will not shop you know they them pronouns to your vulnerable child it's becoming harder not easier it's not like oh, there's been this break and now, um, you know, we know that those forces are all going the opposite direction institutionally. And, and you know, this DEI order from the Biden administration, of course, will accelerate that, not decelerate it. I, th I think I've said this before, but I do think this is really driven by some high profile Gen X defectors. Mm 
And I do think Gen X is making a really interesting political turn here. Um, according to all of the long-term surveys we have, Gen X is, is going more conservative faster than boomers did at their age, right? So, so Gen X will probably be um, the conservative generation uh, in, in America, but millennials and Gen Z are accelerated in the in the left direction. And they are not becoming more conservative as they get older the way that past generations have. I really think you have this kind of, um, for those who are not watching, I'm making a V shape with my hands. I really think <laughs> you're going to you're going to have like a, ba a great generational warfare, basically, between millennials and Gen X um, as boomers start to fade out of power. And one of the things that reminded me about this was Whoopi Goldberg talking about Nikki Haley mm. and Don Lemon saying she's not in her prime or whatever. Um, of course, the you know, response from the from the center right and the establishment right was like, no, she's our girl boss. And you just don't like that. She's the first <laughs> she's the first uh, minority governor. And it just makes liberals heads explode or whatever. That was her um, fundraising email that went out. after. Um, so I, that I found all incredibly cringy. But um I do think it was interesting because Whoopi Goldberg backed up Don Lemon and basically said, no, 51 is not the prime. She's not the new generation because she ran this whole uh, ad on uh, we're the new generation of leadership. Right. Um, and I, I, I really think like this is going to be the shape of, you know, with a boomer sort of throwing out the first shot, the first generational shot between millennials and Gen X. Right. I think largely the leadership in the Republican Party is going to be. Uh, Gen X and the leadership, the new ranks of leadership in the Democratic Party are going to be millennials and we're going to go to war with each other. Unfortunately for us, not as millennials, but as people of the right, millennials are much more, much bigger generation. Yeah. And uh, Zoomers and the generation, like, that's the other thing, like we talk about Gen Z, we're always talking about the youngest generation as though it's the generation that's like just about to enter the workforce. But imagine the kids that um, literally were given the 1619 project in American history classes, right? Like Zoomers were were mostly um, already in college where that stuff has been used for years anyway. But imagine like the young children, the kids, you know, that were five in 2021, 2022, whatever, when that started circulating through curricula. Um, imagine the kids who were grown up with that, um, the kids who don't remember a time before Wi-Fi was like oxygen, just sort of floating through every little, uh, you know, place where there's air. Um, these kids are not entering the workforce in big numbers yet. We have no idea uh, how damaging this all is going to be on uh, their ability to function and to help us keep functioning as a society. I mean, we can't, you know, get planes out at Christmas. We can't, you know, have a functioning USPS. We can't um, get trained safely from one place to the other without, you know, hurting small town Ohio and then having government and private industry collude um, to, you know, cover certain things up. I mean, we just are struggling to perform basic functions now. Um, so even if there are changes around the edges, uh, and by the way, just as we were talking, I saw Vanity Hair, Fair, Vanity Fair headline, not Vanity Hair, Vanity Fair headline, um, about how New York Times staffers are criticizing the union for defending the Times, um, in the anti-trans coverage debacle. So yes, like such a promising sign that the Times stood up for journalism that should never have had to happen um, and should have happened five years ago at worst. Um, but even that is not going quietly because there are still so many people in all of these generations who may not be as vocal because it has fallen out of fashion, but who's, this is the big point, um, the big point is that we have taught all of these people that their sense of purpose comes from signaling their virtue um, in like racking up woke virtue signal wins because they don't have a sense of purpose outside of that. And when you have taught generations of people um, to find their purpose in that, it is not unlearned easily. That is not a foundation that crumbles overnight for the vast majority of people. And so, uh, you know, we, we talk about Nietzsche a lot here, who said that people are going to build their own uh, religion, their own gods, their own idols um, in the absence of the sort of Western foundation, the Judeo-Christian Western foundation. Um, 
that doesn't change if the vibe shift comes about and, you know, maybe superficially kills wokeness in, you know, like Sam B not being on the air anymore. <laughs> That's just not how it works. Like this is so much deeper um, that, you know, it's good to celebrate what we're seeing uh, in the tip of the iceberg, but under the surface, uh, the, the iceberg is still there and very dangerous. It's also a direct patronage system. Right. So it's not just the, the cultural indoctrination, but it literally we are creating at a faster and accelerating pace, not a slowing down pace, except maybe I have an amendment to this. But um, certainly in, in the, the government sphere, um, we are creating more and more jobs, grant programs and various rewards structured around identity politics and around what you you just referred to as woke, uh, you know, racking up woke points, right? Um, and that that is not going away. Um, that's accelerating. So that's one one aspect of it. I, the only like sort of bubble of hope in that regard, I do think we're starting to see. Not to be, you know, not to give myself credit for this, but uh, <laughs> I do think we're we're uh, seeing what I predicted uh, with regard to the Elon Musk model. We are seeing the DEI departments of large tech companies that are now going through contraction. Uh, they are starting to cut those jobs um, as as fat to cut, right? That ultimately that rubber meets the road sort of mentality. When you have somebody like Musk out there giving the example of like, hey, you can actually just fire all these people um, mm. and if you need to cut payroll. Um, and if anyone's interested in that argument, you can either read it uh, in, in the Washington Examiner or you can go to some of our previous episodes. I think you and I have discussed this quite a bit, but um, I, I am starting to see that happening um, and there are numbers to back that up. So that that's hopeful to me. That's more hopeful than than this idea. But I, I previous successions of sort of cultural revolutionary ideas that were then entrenched in American life like also had this ebb and flow, right? Where, where it's not actually, we're not actually scoring victories. We're halting it, pausing it for a minute when, until the institutional forces then overwhelm slowly, right? So like um, I could see it, it being completely true that we might pause, you know, uh, gender transition for minors here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not ultimately, I mean, look, I'm in favor of it. It's a, it's a victory in the sense that it's horrific what we're doing to young people and the detransitioners coming out or testifying to that. But in, in, if, if it comes to the compromise that like, oh, hey, like this is a great and celebrated thing. And in fact, you're going to get a patronage network job, six figure job based on your being quote unquote trans, right? Um, you're just going to have a lot of people transitioning at 18. Right? It's, yeah. it's, it's not actually... Yeah that like different now i'm glad in the sense that still it's it's still more horrible the, the younger and more vulnerable these kids are when they make these these sometimes irreversible decisions about their bodies that's horrible in its own right so it's not that i'm like against any of these things but the actual substance of the cultural movement itself there's no firewall between like 17 and 18 it's just you're gonna have gender reveal parties at, for for 18 year olds that's not actually a substantive victory it's a pause that's right? well so and let's take one like one really high profile example jk rowling say that we come to a cultural consensus on the question of transgenderism in uh single sex spaces you know restrooms women's shelters prisons and children Say we get back just to that baseline of sanity on those questions. You are still left with J.K. Rowling, um, you know, believing, as she does, that transgenderism um, in adults is something that is perfectly acceptable and laudable as a treatment for dysphoria. Um, and that is the case with many, many, many people on that side of the issue. So, well, again, I think you're right. The incentive structure in uh, certain corporations and in certain institutions, government, the state governments in Florida and all of these little red places. Um, yes, the incentive structure is changing and that is fantastic. Um, but it's like, you know, are, are, there's a real question as to whether these are sort of like the levees in New Orleans, right? That can withstand, you know, the, the first onslaught of the water, um, but then as it just gushes in the future, um, they they break and crumble. And we don't know because we don't know exactly how bad. We can predict that 
the onslaught will probably be pretty bad because of all of these reasons. Um, so, but we also don't know how strong that, you know, incentive structure can be as a fortification. Um, so obviously, yes, like encourage it, keep doing it. It is a big, big, big deal. It's good. It's going to save young people's lives. There's no question about it. Um, but at the end of the day, even if we can do the very difficult work of coming to a cultural consensus on that stuff, uh, which I don't think we ever fully can, but to the extent that we can improve the cultural consensus on those questions, we're still left with a culture that is totally lost. You know, we're still left with the culture of of uh, 2010, um, the culture of even 2015. And that's not a great place to be. It's better than where we are now, but it's not a great place to be. Yeah, that, that's actually a great transition to one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is um, a Ross Douthat article um, on the introduction of the smartphone and, and mental health crisis among young people, in which he criticizes this. And, and I, I think this goes way beyond this particular technological argument and Jonathan Haidt's thesis about um, the 2007 break essentially in an escalating, like crazily escalating um, serious mental health problems uh, among young Americans. Um, so, but that, that it, we'll get to that like kind of actual substantive debate in a minute, but um, he, he really critiques something that I think is, um, is, is, is very similar to what, what you just said about like going back to 2010 and, um, and he has this wonderful, actually, paragraph, um, the way that he he wrote it up, um, talking about how this is essentially, this, this was a hollow. This consensus that seemed like it was actually working out, and, you know, we mocked the, the sort of um, moral majority right for having, quote-unquote, slippery slope fallacies about where some of this permissiveness and hollowing out of, of the, the foundation... Um, the Judeo Christian foundation of the society would go because, in that very specific and, and like blip in time, right? Um, in, in the 90s and, and to early 2000s, those, those, um, essentially the, the winds were mild. Mm. What, what doubt that writes, you know, America's on top of the world with people writing about the end of history, right? Which is very unfair, by the way, that essay, but, but it has come to stand. It. I yeah. Have, I guess I feel bad for Fukuyama because. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that phrase came to stand in for a certain view, like America's on top of the world, prosperity is going to continue to escalate, right? Um, this social liberalism actually didn't yield um, any of these these sort of wild negative consequences. They seemed like kind of kind of wild and and crazy. Oh, the like the, the crazy moral majority Christians. Oh yeah, there's going to be uh, you know men are going to want to be women, and we're going to interchange. <laughs> Uh, of course, now we look back and we see those actually, if anything, they undersold a lot of those slippery slope predictions. And the, the slippery slope has been, you know, the big winner of, of the 2020. <laughs> um, big W. Um, but I, I want to read what doubt that wrote the last last paragraph. Um, so he taught him here. He's talking about um, the, the introduction of the smartphone as this technological break that may very well have precipitated in, in um, specific some of these mental health crises. But he says, if you are comfortable with the world of the early Obama years, it makes a lot of sense to focus on the technological shock that brought us to this place, to lament and attempt to alter its effects. But those effects should also yield a deeper scrutiny because what looked stable and successful 15 years ago now looks more like a hollowed out tree standing only because the winds were mild, waiting for the iPhone to be swung gleaming like an ax. Hmm. I think that's just that is very much connected to this idea, both politically and technologically. If we can just get back, if we can ban minor transition, right? Or if we can get an article from J.K. Rowling in the New York Times, if we just consolidate this '90s liberalism where everything was was great, um, not recognizing that one, the seeds of that sort of liberal agreement yielded exactly where we are now, and two, the only reason that it seemed okay or working out for some time is essentially it was a, an unprecedented period of global peace and um without any major technological shocks without uh, you know any any major um, direct danger to the homeland i mean 9-11 really brought that that era to a close but politically it continued for the next 10 years um 
So I, I just, I don't know, I, th this, the center liberalism and this idea we saw it with Pinker as well, criticizing Rufo and, and Governor DeSantis for actively going in and trying to address the curriculum and, and the substantive values of public universities. There is this idea, if we can just turn it back a little bit, that we can, we can fix all of this. Yeah, no, that's a really, really, really important point. And actually, it's one that I don't hear a lot of people talking about because and, and you know, to some extent, that's reasonable, right? Because we have to solve the problems that are in front of us. But we should talk about the problems that are in front of us in a way that uh, appreciates their true root. Um, you know, you, you can talk about sort of what we see on the surface, but um, that only gets you so far. If we're going to be spending time talking about the problem of tech, um, talking just about social media isn't that helpful um, because this is a, a brand new, you know, to talk about hyper novelty is uh, you mentioned this is just sort of a brand new uh, way of life for, for human beings. It's, it's a lot of the way that we live right now is just completely foreign to our bodies and our minds. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, even for all of the health benefits of these technological innovations, we are struggling to be happy. And that trend line starts going down decades before the iPhone is introduced. Arthur Brooks has written about that. Um, even as we started to live in bigger houses, um, you know, at least with, with more material comforts than we'd ever have before, happiness is going down. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that prescription medication is, you know, use of prescription medication is skyrocketing. It doesn't make a lot of sense that um, overdoses are, are skyrocketing. These things just don't make a lot of sense if you aren't considering the full scope of the change. So I agree with what Douth had said um, about the, the tree, uh, just waiting for the ax of the iPhone. But to your point, Inez, I'm not sure most of the rights um, foot soldiers or most of the rights, uh, I shouldn't say foot soldiers, I should say most of the rights allies, most of the rights non-conservative allies in the battles of today are allies in the battles that will ultimately count, if that makes sense. Um, and the sooner we get to those, obviously, the better off we'll all be. I do think there are some really interesting case studies of people like Dave Rubin, um, who, and there are, I think a lot of people are like Dave Rubin, who come from the left and had their eyes opened up um, to the moral depravity of, you know, the, the broader leftist worldview by things like COVID, by things like the excesses of transgenderism, and they're sort of gradually, incrementally uh, moving not just to the center, but to the right. So I do think that's happening. I think it's sort of a gateway drug. Uh, some of these issues are a gateway drug to uh, not just conservatism, but um, you know, just a, a healthier outlook on life. Um, so I think that's true. Just like you know, the the FBI and Trump era has been a gateway drug for conservatives uh, to getting blackpilled on the deep state. Uh, these are all like realignment questions, but uh, you know, th it is true that some of these issues will will bring people, um, you know, w will can will win converts, but that's, you're going to need a whole lot of converts, uh, to, you know, improve the human condition at this point. Yeah, that, that's really true, um, about the converts. Cause I've seen this happening with the TERFs, right? The trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, I have a lot of uh, work with a lot of, um, TERFs like IW, we work with, with some great organizations, Wolf in the past, for example. And so I count many of them as friends. So, um, but I, it, it's interesting. I always make the joke on Twitter that, I'm, people call me a turf, and I said, I'm, I'm, don't call me a turf. I'm not a feminist, right? I am trans, <laughs> trans exclusionary, but um, I, I was recently in Scotland and happened to be there while there was this like big gender rally, right? And and it really struck me that the two sides of this, right, the sort of turf side of of the feminists was kind of the moms, like the old school feminist moms, mm. and then on the trans side are largely their kids. Now, it's, mm. it's obviously true that being a conservative and raising your children in a conservative framework doesn't protect them from the, the culture at large so completely. There are obviously cases where conservative families are dealing with this. So that that is not my point that like only people on the left um, have to deal with this, this question or only TERFs do. But it did strike me as like, 
you know, these kids did imbibe what you said about the fact that there's no right way to be a woman, for example, that femininity has nothing to do with with uh, biology, that that men and women actually, for all intents and important purposes, like life, family, career, they should be interchangeable for those. But hold on, not for the 200 meter butterfly. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the turf movement. Honestly, I think sometimes they take more direct fire than we do on the right because they are still very much plugged into those left-wing yes. networks meaning their friends are the ones who are abandoning them their jobs are the ones who will fire them right we're we're kind of pre-canceled in that way so it still takes enormous <laughs> courage to do what they're doing so it's, it's i'm not taking it away from them at all and i do consider them allies in particular fights but nevertheless i'm kind of um I feel like it's important for conservatives to articulate these differences that you can't actually go back to 90s feminism as a subcategory of this general, you know, let's go back to the 90s kind of movement. You know, you can't do that um, without setting up all of the conditions that led us to where we're at right now. But I do think you're right that there's a certain subset of those that those turfs or like other commentators outside of that turf world who are just kind of on their way to being conservatives. Right there, yeah. there. This is this is a stopover on a way of um, a, a more deep political conversion, and that definitely happens. But I think it's a minority of of the folks who kind of stand in those classical liberal IDW turf kind of networky um, spaces. But it is it is it does happen for sure. Like but I, definitely, I know some people who are they still call themselves sort of folks on the left, but on every substantive and deep proposition, they, they're starting to really examine what like what their beliefs were in the 90s and 2000s and, and the connection between those beliefs and, and what they have definitively rejected today. Um, but but I do think it's important to talk or to speak to and have our arguments speak to those those actual distinctions and go to the heart of them. Um, yeah. But- and like Libby is a good example. Libby Emmons. Um, yeah, yeah we were talk about Dave Rubin, but Libby is like such a great example too of somebody who um, the like trans wars and political correctness was a total gateway drug um, that really uh, mm-hmm. changed her mind about her own, her own worldview and, and brought her um, to a more like traditionalistic outlook on things. And I think um, in a, uh, porn saturated world, especially the world of Gen Z, but the generations uh, behind Gen Z, totally porn saturated, totally post sex in the city. Um, you know, we we can't just be content to say, yeah, let's get back to a time when internet porn was really hard to look at. Uh, you know, it was it was really hard to get to internet porn. Like, yes, that is a great step, um, but that doesn't preclude us from having, you know, every Kardashian's ass on Instagram um, at every every given moment. And it doesn't preclude those children from putting their asses on Instagram um, on a Finsta where their parents aren't seeing it or on Snapchat where it disappears, whatever. Um, you know, that because if you're back to the sort of sexual mores of 2010, uh, when Jezebel reigns supreme, uh, that's just not good enough. That is a, a very unhappy and unhealthy place to be as a society, and it's not sustainable. Well, and it's the last bit is important. You can't just freeze in time in the 90s. Like these ideas have a way of working themselves out, right? These these permissive structures about whether it's about sex or in gender, or it's, it's about you know any other like sort of political uh, political structure. These these um, these assumptions have a way of actually working themselves out. They don't stand still in time. You don't, you don't get Mm. to like just declare a certain kind of permissiveness and then like be surprised when, for example, the civil rights revolution extends more and more to like invented new and invented categories of victims, right? Once you establish the idea, the the fundamental idea that we're going to reward um, identity politics victims, there are necessarily going to be more characterizations of identity politics victims. And a really good example of this, of course, is the increasing um, ramp up of, of a, a uh, political movement to declare MENA a category, right, on the census, right? That's, what is it, Middle Eastern and North African, right? To, to basically exclude more and more people from that evil, that evil category of, of white male cis straight oppressor, right? You can't be surprised about the consequences of this. Um, I do want to ask you about the underlying uh, sort of, or I should say just like the example that Douthat uses, because it's something that 
you talk a lot about, right? The, the effects of technology and, and you, you, um, I think you used the word rickety, right? Like rickety foundation earlier when we were talking, um, like what's the, the, and we kind of come back to this a lot. <laughs> I feel like the, the found the, the relationship between that rickety foundation and then these very concrete technological revolutions that are producing an enormous amount of fragility to the point where it's very difficult to, for, for two people on the side of these like sort of generational divides uh, in a way that I don't think is true about like, say, old, older millennials or Gen X and, you know, boomers who are maybe the same number of years apart or even more years apart, but like don't feel as, it doesn't feel like talking to the other side of the black mirror in, in the same way, you know what I mean? So um, what do you think is is there any kind of solution for a couple generations of Americans who are going to be kind of this fragile? And it seems really difficult as adults. Like, how do you get out of that? Like, how do you, I mean, it's almost like a psychological problem, um, but ultimately a political one. I don't know if you know who Maggie Rogers is. She's roughly my age, the, the singer. Um, she's a, a great Your artist. Uh, young who's... Is, is, is in comparison to my age being old. No, continue. <laughs> Meaning, meaning born in the early 90s. Um, and <laughs> that's what I meant. Um, she posted on Instagram yesterday. I just saw this while I was scrolling through my feed and thought it was interesting. Um, she posted yesterday to say that something that has never happened before is happening at her concert. She's noticed on the in the early stages of this new tour that she's on. She said people are uh, starting to have panic attacks and pass out in the audience in more numbers or great, great with greater frequency than she's ever seen before. And she has a big, as someone who's been to her concerts, a big uh, Gen Z following and even maybe even younger than Gen Z um, because it's one of those, you, you go to those concerts and it's one where, you know, people are there with their parents um, and their parents are supervising, you know, like a, a group of like 10 teenage girls um, in, you know, Birkenstocks with socks on, which is something that I did non ironically in like 2006. Um, but that aside, um, I found that really interesting. It's like a, a window into what's to come um, because that's just Gen Z. Uh, think about the kids who grow up, grew up behind Gen Z who were literally children during the pandemic and maybe it took them longer to talk. Maybe it took them longer to uh, pick up on human emotion. Um, I don't know. But if we, that's the part of the thing it, in, the, in a weird way, this is a weird parallel. It reminds me a little bit of what's happening in East Palestine, Ohio right now, because you don't know how damaging these chemicals and the air and the water are going to be to people. Like we really don't know in some cases with 9-11 first responders, we didn't know um, about the accumulated carcinogens and how they would affect people's health. I mean, in some, with some cases we're still learning um, and the, it's just, going to be, it's very hard. It's very hard to know what happens when, for instance, Gen X, you know, as you've, you've laid out, when they hit 40, when they hit 45, well, there have been big changes because now they have kids and now there's an iPhone and now there's porn everywhere. Um, and you have no idea what happens when, you know, the kids younger than Gen Z hit voting age. Um, we have no idea what kind of technologies. We're talking about brainwave technology for your employer. This is something that was talked about seriously at Davos um, in an interesting speech. They'll be able to track your brainwaves to tell when you're focused and when you're not. Um, the, yeah, it, it's so creepy. Right, right. And like, imagine the safetyism that comes with that. I mean, you have the hate Lukianoff book from 2015, right? The coddling of the American mind. And you have, uh, what was the, uh, the bloom book, the shrinking of the American, the closing of the American mind, um, decades before that one. Uh, so just imagine what scale this problem is going to be on. Um, and the, the sort of tinkering around the edges or dealing with the tip of the iceberg that we can see above the surface, because it's where we can find consensus, um, is, is just not going to be enough. And I think if our society feels like it's not sustainable now, um, I don't think it's getting uh, substantially better. I think it's getting superficially better. Yeah. I mean, and, and in terms of the mental fragility of young people, it's getting demonstrably worse and measurably worse. Right. Right. Um, and actually here, I'm going to, I'm going to quote, uh, somebody who I went, I, I feel like, um, and the reason I'm, I'm quoting him is, um, this guy is that we went to high school together. He was one year under me. 
Um, we had some friends in common. I mean, I wouldn't say we're like best friends or anything like that, but we knew each other in high school. Um, and he's definitely a guy that left a communist, right? Um, <laughs> but I feel like actually we both got a seat to this revolution a little bit earlier in the sense that Palo Alto was already in mental health crisis. Um, in part because perhaps we had access to some of these technological advances earlier. But also, mm. I think because of that reign of this kind of 90s liberalism was so strong in Palo Alto um, and so advanced in Palo Alto that in many cases it was the first. But I, I remember my dad being completely shocked with the percentage of people, of, of kids in Palo Alto that were on, like, they all had therapists. Half of them were on, like, <laughs> mental medication. It's not right? Poland. He was like, what's wrong with all these kids? Like, they have great lives as far as I can tell, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And there was, there was a suicide, a uh, series of suicide clusters that was recognized by the CDC. There were, like, Atlantic articles. It became a national story, right? What's mm. wrong with the kids of Palo Alto? Well, now I feel like that's extended to most kids, right? Like that frame is now the frame on an entire generation and possibly two, right? So um, this this uh, this guy, Malcolm Harris, um, he wrote in the Intelligencer a few few uh, few years ago, but he, he retweeted it in context of the debate today, um, said when it, meaning this crisis, right? When it's framed as a youth mental health crisis, the solutions are individual, one malfunctioning brain at a time, even as the issue is obviously social. The scholarship is on uh, long-term scholarship on long-term developments and cohort mental health suggests it's not individual disasters that matter, but rather enduring social changes. America has become an increasingly difficult place to be a happy child, and it's well past time to start treating that as an urgent political problem. He highlights political, right? Um, obviously, his solutions are like literally diametrically opposite from what you or I probably think is a good, a, a good set of solutions. Um, he, he points, for example, to like climate change and the end of the world as like the reason that kids are depressed and kind of downplays the technological aspect of this. Um, but I, I, I do think um, that that consideration is worth considering. And it reminded me something of, of your speech at NACON, where you were talking about how problems like mental fragility increasing, you know, SSRI use, obesity, um, diet, right? These these kinds of problems actually should be political problems. We should think about them as political problems rather than as individual sets of choices. Um, and and our, our side, neither side, the left or right, has really come up with a political framework for thinking about the fragility or how to deal with the fragility and the very real fragility. I feel like a lot of people on the center left and on the right believe it's like fake you know like these kids mm -hmm. are faking it mm -hmm. i increasingly don't think they're faking it i think they mm -hmm. actually are passing out i think they actually you know they believe they're they're um they have what is it like the uh, identity disorders where they're the system and they swap out different <laughs> different identities right um they, they really do feel more uncomfortable in their bodies they feel more disembodied like these are i think real and the question is is it a, one is it a political problem and two what is the beginning of a political framework or to address it. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think to the extent the left does think about these things, um, if I think about like Michael Bloomberg, who I am placing firmly on the left here, um, his solution is to increase government power over individual choice um, and ban big gulps when it comes to obesity, when it comes to, you know, he's, he's really taken it to Coca-Cola by banning big gulps. Well, again, that's, I mean, that's not even coming close to what might need to happen here, which is uh, evaluating whether the products that Coca-Cola sells should plainly, um, wh whether they actually are fundamentally edible. <laughs> like, that sounds like a ridiculous question, um, although people should know you can actually, yeah, she's drinking Coke Zero. Uh, even though people should know, like, you can actually clean your toilet with Coke. Um, it's like, it is that chemical um and that sort of unnatural as a chemical um unlike i mean i know there are some natural chemicals you could clean with but you get what i'm saying um this question about whether some of these foods are fundamentally edible whether they should meet what basic fda standards are it's not that we need to put more government control over individual choices um it's that what we need to do is use existing parameters 
of what is and is not okay for corporations to do, right? Like we don't let corporations sell food that hurts you. We already do that. We just need to ask bigger questions about what hurts you. <laughs> and, and so I think the left's answer in many cases, like with social media, um, is to, to ban things, to increase government and corporate control over private life. And the problem with the right not coming up with workable solutions beyond just punting it to the private sector is that it's a huge vacuum. The left is going to fill with more government. And the I was thinking about this this week with the rolled doll stuff. I did a little point for a, a little uh, segment for breaking points on this. Um, one thing the right really gets wrong, to your point, Inez, is so important. The right gets wrong that they believe people aren't actually offended by these words, that people aren't actually offended by the fat shaming of Augustus Glue. Well, they are. Um, it's not every kid, uh, but there are a whole lot of kids who have been taught from their earliest level of consciousness that these things are hurtful, that they actually should cause a psychological in injury. Um, and so when you're conditioned to be psychologically injured by those sorts of things, you will indeed be psychologically injured by those types of things. And that's why, you know, the whole, like, uh, uh, Ben Dominich had a good uh, post on this not too long ago about, like, conservative mockery and ranting and raving against cat ladies is completely, first of all, like, counterproductive and, and also just, like, morally dubious uh, because people are really suffering and they're suffering from, you know, for good reason because the culture that you're constantly decrying, rightfully so, has done exactly what you said it's doing. It's hurt people. And so they are actually influenced in that way, exactly the way that people predicted. Like, people actually are offended. They actually are um, emotionally fragile. They actually are hurt and, and mocking them and acting as though that doesn't exist is not the way to solve these problems. Um, the way to solve these problems is to, to think really deeply about sort of the parameters that we've already drawn. You know, we, we say certain things, like we have parameters for speech. Speaking of Elon Musk, like that's one of the things he understands is that like uh, applying a broad first amendment principle to something that functions, uh, as a common carrier, whether you believe that's legal, a legal definition or not, um, is actually really effective. You don't necessarily need to devise all of these new ways to censor people. Um, you know, we have parameters from the FDA. Like we, we all agree as a society that you shouldn't be able to sell something um, that is addictive and hurtful. Um, and like these things are just clear. You don't necessarily need more government to do them, but you do need to think much more, much more seriously about um, whether these products that we've just sort of come to accept as good. Um, and I'm talking about products like obscenity, uh, not to sound like Tipper Gore here, but Camille Paglia makes great points about how art is better when you have parameters that police obscenity. That's absolutely true um, because you actually, artists have lines to subvert. They have lines to cross. Um, so thinking about, you know, whether we are all psychologically better off, um, you know, what actually constitutes obscenity? What actually constitutes, um, you know, sexual whatever, you know, obscene obs uh, laws that we have or regulations that we have, even if they're self-imposed um, in Hollywood, um, just thinking about what meets that bar, rethinking it. Um, that's a really hard thing to do because people have been conditioned to believe that, you know, basically nothing should be out of bounds for Hollywood. And if it is, then somebody who thinks it's out of bounds is necessarily bigoted or stupid or evil in some way. I get it. It's hard. But as people start suffering more and more and more, it's incumbent on the right to actually make a bold argument instead of just finding that common ground with our kind of allies on the surface. Um, you, you have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I kind of disagree with that Ben piece, um, Ben Dominich's piece. I mean, he makes a really good case about the cat ladies, right? About overly mocking. There, I think the the difference to me is i'm not in favor of mocking essentially the younger generations that i believe are actually fragile um i do to some extent believe in making an example of people sure who have made bad decisions in the hopes and the missing piece for me that in that column that he wrote which was otherwise convincing was 
the, the younger generation coming up, right? Mm. It's one thing and cruel and unnecessary to mock, let's say, like a generation of, of uh, women who for her went marriage and, and family um, and in favor of like girl boss careerism or whatever. Uh, but it's only constructive, I think, to the extent that we should be able to tell younger women, right, who still have those those decisions and possibilities in front of them. Look, you don't want to make you want to end up like this person that is is like has certain elements of patheticness in, in what they're chasing in life now. And by the way, this is an aside. Chelsea Handler's video is a joke. Yeah, that was a it's joke. It's satire. Please, for the love of God, this is a message to conservative media. It's self-satire. It's self-deprecating. Stop treating it as though it's not, as though it's like a, an earnest video, please, because it's really embarrassing. Anyway. Well, um, I think the first half of it was like not self-deprecating. The second half of it was self-deprecating and it was like kind of confused on its own merits. So like I originally retweeted it because I only watched the first half of it and then I went back and watched the whole thing. So the first half of it, I was like, I can't watch any more of this. Like it was making me too uncomfortable. Um, and then I watched the whole, I forced myself to watch the whole thing and I was like, she doesn't even know what she's doing with this joke. <laughs> like this joke is just oh, yeah, terrible. No, I confused about it as well, but like it was clearly a satire. But anyway, like it, it it paradoxically, you know, we talk a lot about narcissism and the culture, and that's obviously something that has been a political subject uh, for for a while. But you know, the the, the sort of um, psychological definition of narcissism are, is not somebody who's overly like sort of um, asserting their selfish interests above all, but rather somebody who is incapable of having a core self without just imbibing and reflecting other people's opinions of them right like that's the clinical apparently definition of narcissism as a as a pathology is actually not having any sense of self-worth and and that you can see how that makes you one fragile and two extremely controlling of the people around you right because if there's no core to who you are it's just like a fun house of narcissistic mimetic reflection all the way down right and and it becomes very very important to make sure that nothing ugly is reflected in those mirrors mm -hmm. um, around you of other people and I, I do think like this describes our politics fairly well um and when did christopher lash write culture of narcissism like <laughs> decades ago so again like i can do the meme where i hold hands with the turfs on trans issues um but even like the left never fully reckoned with christopher lash they just never did it they haven't re they haven't really reckoned with welbeck they haven't really rec reckoned with a lot of people um who have made these really smart criticisms of the left largely from the left if not entirely from the left um but like largely from non conservative perspectives um, because the left is built on this self-perpetuating model of you know uh, now the the philosophy of the left fundamentally has to preclude um, criticisms because those criticisms are all bigoted and therefore they have no place in the left so when you're operating on this model you are never going to reckon with that like inner nicene criticism um and so sure great like let's do the meme um but we will still be in a culture of narcissism that is eating itself from the inside out yeah it, it'd be remiss here uh, if we're talking about technological shocks and and psychology um not bringing up before we close the, the advancements are, are the recent stuff with the AI, right? Um, and it's become really clear, for example, that there's, uh, I guess, for some of the chat bots, there's um, the real AI, which is really imbibing, like, sort of, uh, is, is quote unquote, noticing the entire internet and noticing patterns. Um, and then there's sort of controlled AI. So, so the, the, the programmers are actually putting a filter on most of these bots. Um, these these AI bots in order to make sure that, for example, they think that Charles Murray's scholarship is off limits, right? Um, and so there, there's there's questions surrounding this. Apparently, um, you can you can get around that that filter. You can you can create. Um, there was something that went super viral uh, on the internet, like Dan, right? Um, Dan is the bad AI, and you can tell that you can program the AI, like you kind of like prod it into thinking. If you didn't have this filter and you were this evil version of yourself, what would you say, right? Um, but it it turns out that you know AI is is uh, is noticing things that the woke left would not like like it to notice and um how this is going to impact 
the advancement of AI is is one question I have for you. And the follow up question would be something truly, a truly like horrendous possibility that was raised for me by somebody um, who was giving a really interesting talk I was listening to about AI is not just that because we've all already thought about, you know, the fact that people are going to potentially lose their jobs and there's potentially going to be a lot of leisure time depending on how much we can automate, right? That is a, a, a scary but familiar question at this point. Um, the, the scarier question he was raising was at what point is there no unmediated, no contact between human beings that is unmediated by, by an AI? And if that AI has a certain filter, um, will it cut off the the possibility of authentic connection or spreading of ideas that essentially um, the AI like doesn't want spread, right? I, I mean, th that's a really, that's a really like one level more terrifying to me, especially well, given all the trends for isolation that we've been talking about over and over again. Yes, exactly that. Yeah, I was on, uh, having a conversation with Crystal about this on Breaking Points today, which is um, the Google layoffs, uh, a lot of people who were laid off speculated that that was uh, a product of an algorithm that uh, of, of some algorithmic influence. And Google says that's not the case, but uh, human resource managers around the country you know, say basically this is an, an inevitable, if not already happening at many companies. And you know, we were having this conversation and I was thinking to myself, um, well, first of all, some of this already happens in Amazon warehouses where people are surveilled. Um, but when you think about the brainwave tech that we talked about earlier, that will happen really quickly. Um, think of how quickly Zoom happened. Um, think of how quickly email happened. Like email might actually be low key the biggest example of uh, the sort of um, professional intrusion into people's private lives that was just accepted immediately, basically. Um, you know, when, when you think about these things and you think about how quickly and you know, easy it is to imagine, you know, one company starting with brainwave monitoring tech and then that getting adopted more broadly because, you know, under the guise of like, oh, this is good for us, blah, 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 blah. Um, well, someone who lives across the world, on the other side of the world from you, could be monitoring your brainwaves and seeing that you are not focused, um, you know, for X hours. And, and maybe that's not a mistake. Maybe you are in mourning. Maybe something horrible happened to you. Um, you know, maybe you're going through a divorce, whatever it is, and you're still getting your work done, but your brainwaves are showing that you're distracted um, because that's a normal part of human existence. And somebody in, let's say, Singapore fires you because the algorithm, uh, the numbers that you're reduced to on their end, just don't, you know, they're, they're just not working out and the company needs to cut some fat. Well, that used to happen on a local level. That used to happen in communities with people who knew each other and were largely accountable to each other. Um, and businesses just used to exist on a much, much smaller scale. That's not to say there weren't big businesses, uh, but for the most part, it was human interaction and human interaction on a relatively local level where you could say, hey, this person had a, a rough day or a rough week, but I know it was because their you know, loved one passed away. I know it was because they had a cancer scare. And I also know that they're a really good leader, um, which is not something that AI is going to ever be able to capture. That's an, an, an intangible thing that the person looking at the algorithm in Singapore or in uh, Palo Alto um, maybe you're in DC and they're not going to be able to see that and they're not gonna be able to capture that. Um, and not only will that be unfair, it's not even good business, um, uh, but it will happen quickly. Yeah. And as you say, like these, this is something that essentially with the possibilities of AI versus just old school surveillance, um, is jumping into the professional managerial jobs, right? Mm -hmm. This has already been the case. These kind this like kind of the, your boss is the algorithm is already the case in Amazon warehouses. It has been for quite some time. It has been for, for example, for um, delivery workers who are are working with DoorDash, right? They have 
th- there's been uh, some some great reporting done on how essentially the algorithm only recognizes how quickly you've gotten your deliveries done. So, for example, if your bike breaks down or like your car breaks down, right, if it was a human boss that you were interacting with, they'd say, oh, that's not your fault, you know. Uh, but the algorithm will just punish you. So you'll get worse deliveries and it starts a a cycle where like if something outside of your control happens, it start, kicks off a cycle whereby you're going to be making less money and less opportunity to then like improve your standing right um, with the algorithm. So it's it's essentially stratifying workers in a way that a human boss almost certainly would not, or at least we would we would consider that like very, very poor management of human beings. Well, now this is with the, the possibilities of AI, this is extending into the professional class, right? And Where, again, like, before you couldn't tell if somebody was paying attention or not, as long as they were turning in their work at the end of the day. And again, like we already, one of the interesting things, like as somebody who has been subpoenaed by the NLRB, believe me, I don't want to compliment the NLRB, but they did recently put out a statement saying they're looking into, this was like back in October, uh, potential abuses um, of like surveillance capitalist technology on workers. What does that tell us? What is the implication of that? There are already laws against much of this stuff. It already violates ex- things that are on the books. Do I think sometimes, you know, in a DeSantis type of way, you need legislation that is more specific? Um, perhaps, but it doesn't need to create any new principles of governance, of regulation that don't already exist fundamentally um, in the divide between personal and professional, private and professional. So it doesn't, you know, require, I think Saurabh has a piece in, uh, Saurabh Amari has a piece in Compact out right now about how conservatives need to, um, you know, embrace the administrative state. And I haven't fully read the piece yet, but it's about East Palestine and J.D. Vance's role in all of that. You don't really need to embrace the administrative state without having read the piece, I say this, um, in order to believe that we should have regulations that protect people from chemical spills. Like the, it, you don't have to have an administrative state to do a basic thing like that, to perform a basic regulatory function. And you don't need to have an administrative state of oppressive government encroachment um, to enact basic protections for workers um, that came about in the industrial revolution. Like we just, it, this is not calling for more government. We, we have a framework to deal with a lot of these things, um, but do we have the will? Do we have the power? I think that's an open question. Yeah, I mean, and that's not even digging into the apparent reality and that just like the administrative state, uh, AI may may well be sort of algorithmically stacked against a conservative worldview. It might be stacked against, say, a particular kind of worker's interests or stacked in favor of a particular kind of work. Like this is this is not dealing with this idea that like you can wield, for example, the power of the administrative state or the power of an AI or algorithm um, it's almost like akin to this this idea that you can be objective, right? That, that comes around a lot on the left, like this, that actually we can do the science of governance, right? And we're just advancing the science of governance by turning it over to an AI, <laughs> right? <laughs> or turning it over to the administrative state that's supposed to be quote unquote apolitical, right? Um, it, it, it turns out that these political judgments are necessary and they remain necessary and that that the science or the algorithm or the ai or the administrative state doesn't solve these problems of governance um and and it's very very difficult to use those tools once built i think against their unstated but nevertheless substantive set of ideological principles and mm-hmm. it's very very difficult for conservatives to wield the administrative state that doesn't mean in all cases we shouldn't be looking at what we can do with the power that we have but understand every conservative who is has any pretension to power should understand that you are imagine trying to implement what you want through the faculty lounge. This doesn't mean it's impossible. Chris Rufo is doing it right. And wielding power in a smart way within the faculty lounge, essentially of the, of this uh, university in Florida, but understand that it's going to be difficult. You can't just flip the switch and like turn this entire Leviathan against itself, against right. its, it's, Un, often unstated political commitments. Um, it's not right. that easy. It's turning the Titanic around to keep with the iceberg metaphor. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this is this has been a, a long one. We've gone over an hour, or so uh, I think I'll I'll let Emily go. But before I do, I wanted to point you to some of Emily's other uh, other sort of uh, places where you can you can hear Emily, and one of them 
Is too many Emily's places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to call them Emily's places. Like, yeah. <laughs> em- <laughs> um, but if, if you enjoy this podcast with Emily, um, if you enjoy High Noon, consider tuning in to her other podcast, Federalist Radio Hour, which is a daily podcast hosted by her um, and, and occasionally other folks from the Federalist, the Federalist team of fearless journalists, including Molly Hemingway, Eddie Scary, and David Harciani. They all join in on the fun. They break down politics and culture through interviews with politicians, entertainers, and thought leaders. It is smart, irreverent, provocative, and on the cutting edge of American political thought. We would expect nothing less from Emily uh, as she interviews thinkers from the right, the center, and even the left. The show covers every topic imaginable from data privacy and immigration to big picture issues like feminism. If you want to be part of that conversation as well as this one, don't miss Federalist Radio Hour, which is available every weekday wherever you get your podcasts. And... Uh, I'd like to thank the listeners to this podcast. Um, High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review. That really helps with those AI algorithms that are now and forever going to rule <laughs> the world. Um, but you can find it on Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or iwf.org. Be brave. We'll see you next time on High Noon.